Hi, I'm Dr. Kurt Wohler. I want to talk to you about kids who tend to cycle or, or recycle through digestive problems and just are not improving. What I've seen over the years is that many kids on the spectrum obviously have yeast and bacterial imbalances, many times a lot of food sensitivity problems as well that tend to be a major contributing factor to their autistic characteristics and their ability to move beyond it. And when therapies like dietary therapies, whether it's the low oxalate diet, the specific carbohydrate diet, the gluten casein free diet, yeast diets, or a blend of those diets, antibacterial, antiparasitic, antifungal therapies, and benefits are seen um, and then lost, and this cycle continues over and over and over, and you as a parent, caregiver, are just pulling your hair out, trying to figure out, you know, how do we ever get control of the yeast, and how do we ever get control of the bacteria? It doesn't matter what kind of diet we do, we get, we, you know, we move, you know, three steps forward and two steps back. In my experience, you know, being a physician in the biomedical field now since 1998, in the vast majority of those types of kids, they have a true underlying inflammatory bowel disease condition. And what happens is, is I think more kids on the spectrum have it than are being diagnosed or even recognized. And we get improvement when we reduce bowel toxins. I mean, so you essentially reduce bowel toxicity from yeast and bacteria or parasites you improve bowel function by the release of fecal matter, and that helps to excrete metabolic waste. We, for a period of time, get an improvement in digestive function with you know, less toxic absorption of maldigested food, and we're gonna get an improvement in a child, whether it's improved behavior, improved attention, improved concentration, improved sociability, sometimes improvement in language, and it lasts for a period of time until something goes wrong. They get sick again, change in the weather, change in the seasons, whatever it may be. And we're back to square one. And what I've seen in having these, had these kids, I wish I could do more, um, but in having had many of these kids evaluated um, by doing intestinal scoping through a gastroenterologist, is you will often find inflamed guts um, and what is characteristic of autistic enterocolitis. Now, the main doctor I refer people to um, from a pediatric gastroenterologist uh, is Dr. Krigsman, who's in Texas. And he's been my sort of go-to doctor for these types of assessment now for years. And the reality is, in my experience, there just aren't a lot of doctors around who are willing to evaluate kids on the spectrum from a GI perspective um, to the level that they need to be evaluated and really understand the complexities of it. And what I've seen through Dr. Krigsman's assessments is that these children have inflamed guts, sometimes quite significant, but kids have an amazing ability to compensate for pain. So they're not all manifesting with extreme pain or distress, but we just have this cyclical nature of improvement, this waxing and waning effect of improvement, then worsening, improvement, then worsening, and over and over and over. Um, it's many times is very characteristic of Crohn's disease, which can tend to have a waxing and waning effect. If you have a child that you're suspicious this may be going on, actually go and read about Crohn's disease in kids. I think what you'll see is you'll see a lot of things in the classic description of Crohn's that tends to fit the bowel patterns of many kids on the autism spectrum. So I wanted to make you aware of that because it's, it's something that you know I realize is frustrating and it's an ongoing battle. But if you've been battling this over and over and over for months, if not years, then I really encourage you to look to have your child evaluated from a pediatric gastroenterology specialist who is familiar with the complexities of autism um, to, to see about what exactly is going on in your child's gut. Thanks.